standing outside the old Morris Ice Company with Ellie Morris. Ellie, tell me about how this place that we're standing at moved you to write the book, Cooling the South. Well, I lived here for a year. This is my family's business, and um, we no longer make ice. We quit in 1988, and about 2001, I came back to town, and I love warehouses. I was trying to find a warehouse to live in, and this was here. So I convinced my uncle to let me spend the night here, and then I have to clean up my bedroom and turn it back into <laughs> office every morning. Um, but at nighttime, I would take a flashlight and wander around the plant, and fortunately for me, the three generations that worked here before were all pack rats. So there was lots of information, lots of material, lots of memorabilia left over. And at one point I realized I was kind of sitting on a treasure of a story. So I just pursued it piece by piece. Originally it was just going to be on the state of Mississippi. And then the more I looked into it, the more I realized how big ice was, how important it was, how big it was right now, like times like this when it's yes. really hot. And I just evolved into this book that is cool in the south. Now, not p many people would want to come to a warehouse and, and live for, <laughs> for that amount of time. Well, I mean, what was it like? Was it scary at all when you were I mean, staying in this old warehouse? No, I really didn't think it was. I, I just lived a lot on my own all over the world and hitchhiked and kind of wandered into strange places. So I felt pretty familiar here. Um, we had lots of padlocks. It was entertaining. Not so much scary because the um, ice plant was never designed for somebody to stay inside it. So all the plant, all the um, doors were designed to be padlocked from the outside. So I'd have to get my friends to padlock me in or on occasion I'd order a pizza and I'd get the pizza guy to <laughs> padlock it. He's like, I'm not padlocking some chickens out of an empty warehouse. But, you know, I finally convinced him that that was fine. So it was, um, for me, it was more entertaining than it was frightening. So what did you learn about the ice business as far as what they used to do here as far as getting ice out to people by, when you, you know, researched and wrote your book? Well, um, one of the big things I learned was how big the business was. I had known a few of my stories from my family and as I interviewed people I realized that the industry had really changed the South. That we had no infrastructure prior to artificial ice based on really any kind of preservation other than canning and um, preserving foods with salt that exactly. way. Exactly. So when this cheap commodity came in, it really changed the way we lived. People could move from the country into the city. Um, we could ship our produce and our products up to the Midwest and the North. Industries came from down there to here. The dairy farming was able to come down here. Chicken processing plants could move down here. The textile industry used ice. You had to keep your um, colors and the vats at a steady temperature so that you would always have purple that matched the purple before that. Yeah. They used ice for that. Um, concrete industry, you could start using concrete in the summertime. So it really changed the way individuals could live as well as the economy of the South really radically changed based on ice. And reading some other things about you and hearing some things, what were you seem like you've had an eclectic career <laughs> path and so many different things. Talk about, you had some expeditions in the rainforest? Yeah, I did. I was a photographer for a group of scientists that were studying howler monkeys down there. And I went down, I think there were about seven or eight of us, and we lived down there for almost a month in an area where human beings are normally not allowed. You had to get government permission to be in there. So we had our machetes and whacking our way through the woods the whole time. Um, so yeah, I've, I've done contract work and so that anything that came along that was interesting to me, I pursued it. Yeah, so I mean, you, yeah, you, you went to the rainforest, you did like, uh, you were a kayaking guide, you textbook reader for the blind, all these, are, what's been the most exciting thing you've done? Along, I mean, you lived in a warehouse, <laughs> so. Oh, uh, the most exciting, I don't know. Um, they've all been really fun. I'm having a lot of fun with this book. Um, so that, in a very different way, it's exciting because people are actually buying it and I've gotten a lot of really great reviews on it. Yeah. Um, I had loved being a horseback guide in Australia. We would take people up for a week into the outback country and you wouldn't see any signs of humanity except for little huts every once in a while. So that was really remote. I loved doing that. Um, I like being a tree planter. They all called me, I've forgotten what it was, like the tree angel or something because I would show up and they were so happy that I was interested in their trees. So that was a great job because yeah. they all were happy to see me. <laughs> what about uh, during your, your research, and what was the most interesting thing you learned about the ice block business during the 20s? 
Um, let's see. I have to think about that. Um, something you did, something you discovered that, that maybe you did, didn't even all. know. Um, well, I didn't know that it was used in so many industries, so that was pretty cool to me. Um, well, this was earlier than the 20s, but the reaction to the ice was kind of fun to learn that people had taken it kind of like if we said, here's a glass of water I created in the laboratory, mm -hmm. we wouldn't drink it most likely. And that's what they thought about this ice, that it was artificial. Um, before that, it was all exclusively Mother Nature and God that had made ice. And so there was this country preacher, there's a story in the book about him losing his job because he told people in his congregation that he had seen ice being made in Mississippi in July and they're like, oh, no, 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 you know, you've got some kind of dementia has hit you or the devil has <laughs> taken you over. And so that was kind of fun to me to learn um, that it had a kind of rocky start. Yeah. So what's next for you? I really don't know. I'm concentrating <laughs> on selling this. If I write another book, it's going to have a much shorter title. <laughs> <laughs> this one is really long, yeah. um, but that's the way nonfiction goes. You know, I've noticed that uh, most nonfiction books have a description of what the book is actually about. And even though this one is nonfiction, it's still very story oriented. Um, it's about my journey back in time and the people that I met and how they played a role in that business and the... Um, process of learning about this business and how it became really big and its decline. So it's still story oriented, even though it is nonfiction, but I don't know. I'm concentrating on selling this one right now and we'll see what comes to my so life afterwards. No, no big adventure that you're just dying to go seek out? Or? No, I'd like to go to see uh, Mount Kilimanjaro before the snows disappear. Okay. Somewhere out there on the list. All right. Well, Ellie Morris, thanks for joining us on Don't Lecture Me. Thank you. And use ice. It's yeah. hot. <laughs>